Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. Oh, good evening, hello, good evening, there we are, hallelujah, the mic works now. Well, hello, welcome to Woodlawn, we're so grateful to have you today. Would you stand with us tonight, or today we are going to worship, and we are going to raise some praise in this house. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's do that tonight, or today rather, help us out here, here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Come on, let's sing it out. Here we go. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met it.
bless you in this place, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that fills this room. So tangible. God, everything that we need is right here in your presence and available to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we just bless you and we thank you because you have been a faithful God. No matter what it looks like, no matter what we've done, no matter what the, what the diagnosis says, right? No matter what the world says, our hope is found in the mighty name of Jesus. And you have been faithful and you have been good. And we will sing. We will sing of your goodness no matter what it looks like, Lord. Let's sing that 
that one more time. One more time. Sing it with me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. Sing it out. Every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing with the goodness of God. One more time, one more time. Yes, you do. 
son. We thank you for all you've done and all you're going to do. Give it all to you, God. We give it all to you. So thankful and grateful for you, Father. Be with us tonight. Be with pastors. He brings forth your word, Jesus. Just let us hear from you the word you have for us today. Precious, in your mighty name, we all say amen. 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 God's good. Would you be seated? Turn your attention to the screen. Hey guys, I'm Heather. Welcome to Woodlawn Church and thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. Whether you're here with us in person or joining us online, we're thrilled to have you with us today. It's almost that time again where we start getting ready for Buy a Tree, Change a Life. The idea is simple. Buy a tree, change a child's life, hence the name. Once again, we're partnering with People for Care and Learning in Cambodia and a local mission right here in Canton will benefit too. Signups are open now, and there are several volunteer opportunities to choose from. From cashiers to sales and loaders, we can't wait to see you at this year's Buy a Tree, Change a Life. On November 8th, we're launching our next Growth Track class. If you're new to Woodlawn Church and are ready to learn more, this is your connection. In this powerful four-week course, you'll get a basic introduction to the church, a guidance to biblical essentials, a discovery of your personal gifts, and the invitation to join one of the Woodlawn teams. Signups are open now at the Welcome Center, and we hope to see you there. Don't forget the Hey guys, I'm Heather. Welcome to Woodlawn Church, and thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. Whether you're here with us in person or joining us online, we're thrilled to have you with us today. It's almost that time again where we start getting ready for Buy a Tree, Change a Life. The idea is simple. Buy a tree, change a child's life, hence the name. Once again, we're partnering with People for Care and Learning in Cambodia, and a local mission right here in Canton will benefit too. Signups are open now, and there are several volunteer opportunities to choose from. From cashiers to sales and loaders, we can't wait to see you at this year's Buy a Tree, Change a Life. On November 8th, we're launching our next Growth Track class. If you're new to Woodlawn Church and are ready to learn more, this is your connection. In this powerful four-week course, you'll get a basic introduction to the church, a guidance to biblical essentials, a discovery of your personal gifts, and the invitation to join one of the Woodlawn teams. Signups are open now at the Welcome Center, and we hope to see you there. Don't forget that Pastor Matt is still coming to you live on Facebook with devotionals and prayer time throughout the week. Even if you miss the live stream, once it's completed, these videos will be available on Facebook, YouTube, and the church website, so you'll always have a chance to catch up. That's all we have for right now. If you would like more information, feel free to check out the link below. In the meantime, thanks again for joining us. We're so glad you're here. Woodlawn Church. So good to see you today. If you don't mind, wherever you are, let's go ahead and stand up for the reading of God's Word. We wanted to uh, run those announcements twice just to make sure you didn't miss anything. All right, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> so good to have you today. Thank you for taking the time to worship with us. I'm excited about our, our new series that we're launching here today. Uh, but before we dive into that, I just want to welcome our online audience. You know, we have quite an online audience. Uh, Brian has been telling me, our, our media director, that um, each and every week our online audience continues to grow. So it's been neat. We're seeing some families come back, and we're seeing the online audience grow from week to week. So it's been, it's been good. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to warmly welcome all of you that are tuning in from your home, your iPad, your tablet, your phone at work, whatever. Could we give our online audience today a big hand? So good to have all of you today. And uh, real quick, before we dive into this brand new series that I'm very, very excited about, uh, before we do that today, just want to real quick remind you, if you are uh, new to Woodlawn, maybe you've been here for a little while, you've been kicking the tires, trying to find out if this is your home, 
Uh, I just want to give you a personal invitation to uh, come and join our growth track class. It starts on November 8th uh, at 9 a.m. during the 9 a.m. service. My wife, Christy, and I do that together. She does most of it, um, but the beautiful thing is it's a great way for you to connect and to learn about who we are and how you can connect with us. You'll probably learn a few things about yourself and what God may want to do in your life. So we highly recommend that you come and you check it out. Well, we're going to go ahead and dive into our new series today uh, called Tomorrowland. And I thought it was very much appropriate with everything that we've been through this year. Um, I don't know about you, but 2020... Uh, can leave. Uh, That's fine. Um, I'm ready for a new year. Uh, Obviously, there's lots of memes and things about 2020. And um, one of them, I I saw they they had this info commercial guy. And uh, it says, you know, every second of 2020. And the guy goes, and wait, there's more. And I was like, yeah, that kind of 2020 has kind of been that way. But you know, it's, it's when our world gets shaking like this, that it makes us really stop and value what matters. It makes us want to dig into God's Word and find out what the future holds, to see the future maybe from God's eyes. And that's the whole uh, premise of this series. We're going to be looking at what God's Word says about the future. You know, God has a lot to say about the future. And what does God say? How does that relate to where we are right now in the world in time? But most important, this series is not to fill your head full of knowledge It's to fill your heart full of Jesus so that you can practically live out your walk with him in this world. Because now more than ever, we need the church. We talked about that a little bit last week, to be the church. So we're going to go ahead and study 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, Phenomenal books. They were letters uh, written by Paul. And we're going to fast forward all the way to chapter 4 today. I'll give you a recap of uh, up to chapter 4. But we're going to go ahead and... Uh, really hit it here because this is kind of where he really gets into the meat of his message. We're going to look at a few verses today, verses 13 through 18. Uh, You can follow along with me as I read. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant or uninformed, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's not, they're not snoozing in their lazy boy. These people are gone, (laughs) right? They have died. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I, I love what the Amplified Bible says. It says, for those who have no hope beyond the grave. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Interesting terminology there. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And I like how he ends it here. He says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Father, we just pray today as we gather in your your church to hear your word today. In the midst of a lot happening in our world, a lot of concern, a lot of fear. Lord, in the midst of the days that we are living, Lord, may we find hope today in the fact that you are sovereign and you are in control. May we find hope that you have a plan. May we be your church in this season, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And you can be seated today as you are uh, being seated. Um, I was joking with you a little bit about uh, 2020. And uh, obviously, 2020 probably didn't quite uh, pan out like many of us thought it would uh, back um, in the beginning of the year, back in January, when we actually uh, kicked off uh, the new year. Um, Who would have ever thought that we would be locking down the church, locking down the economy? People would be working from home. Uh, We would be wearing masks everywhere we go. We would be um, quarantining, social distancing, watching church completely online. I mean, who would have ever guessed? And then the fact that it didn't just go away in the summer like we'd hoped, you know, COVID has really been an interesting kind of a little bit of a monster that we've been battling. Just when we think we're getting over it, we have another spike. And, you know, we were thinking back, you know, by the summertime it'll be gone and it's here and, and it's still here. And I don't know about you, but I am ready for it to leave. It can leave anytime it wants. 
But it has affected all of our lives. And not only that, but it's affected our economy. It's, it's affected, um, you know, this, this world that we're living in. I mean, it's affected everything. If you look at the recession that we're in right now, we've been, been facing that um, in our world today. Many of you, some of you have lost jobs. Many of you, your industry, we've seen whole industries be impacted during this season. And, and because, you know, early on there was a lot happening and there was stimulus uh, but now we're kind of really beginning to see, you know, some of this pandemic show up in our economy and believing God that things are going to turn around. But we've, we've seen a lot of uh, things happening in our world. And, you know, you look at the, as we talked about last week, we looked at the racial tensions that we've been facing in our world, the division that we face in our world. And as I was sharing you f- w- from my heart last week, that, that I believe the church of Jesus Christ, God wants it to be a unified, diverse church. And We've been called to love. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And, and those are some conversations that I want to have as we move forward as a church that, you know, you look in the world, then we have all of the division. We have an election coming up, and there's probably been more division and, and uh, pandemonium surrounding an election like maybe we've never seen. And then just stop for a moment and look back to the beginning of this millennium. Remember back just 20 years ago, for those of you that can in 2000, look at what we faced since the year 2000. 2001, we had 9-11 and the terrorist attack. Um, you know, obviously, that, then that launched into wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've had threats of other wars. You know, there's always tension with Russia and China and North Korea and all the things that we've faced there over the years. We've had natural disasters. Many of you remember Hurricane Katrina and how that devastated our country. We've had earthquakes. There's been tsunamis. We, the one that hit Japan back in 09, that devastating tsunami. And you look at all that. You look at the rise of persecution. You know, we don't see it a lot in America, but I think we will. Persecutions of Christians, I think we are definitely going to see more and more of that as time goes on. But around the world, they're seeing it rise around the world. And I was just uh, reading Actually, not reading, but I was listening to the radio the other day, and they were doing a whole excerpt on Nigeria, how there's a group that are, that are just slaughtering Christians right now in Nigeria. And so you look around the world, and these are some troubling times, and it makes people stop and wonder, you know, is Christ coming back soon? What, are these signs of his coming? And like, what, what's, what's happening? What's going to happen? And what's happening is this is creating a lot of fear for people. It's creating anxiety about the future, the future of our country, where we are, dealing with things, where is God in all of this, and, and for a lot of people there's fear, a lot of people there's concern, and so my hope is in this series to dive into this and, and give you great information, but most of all to comfort your heart and give you faith to live out your faith in this era that we're living, but here's what I want to say as we look at Matthew 24 before we dive into 1 Thessalonians, because Jesus was asked about this. They, they said, well, you know, you're, we know you said you're coming back, and what are the signs of your coming? Notice some of these things that we find in Scripture today. It says, this is Jesus' response. It says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. And Jesus answered and said to him, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. There's, there's one sign. Um, See that you are not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation. We've seen that. And kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, we've seen those around the world, pestilences, you know what that means? That actually refers to a contagious disease, a sickness, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. There's persecution, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended. Now, this is predicting that there'll be a, we might talk about that next week, because Paul talks about it in Thessalonians. Before the coming of the Lord, there'll be a a great apostasy, a great falling away. Uh, These confessing Christians will fall from, from the faith. Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So we'll see a lack of love in our world. 
uh, even love amongst believers. But he who endures to the end, there's this, this, this encouragement to endure to the end, will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So right there we begin to see all these signs and these indications that Christ is nearer to coming back. And when we see those things in the world, oftentimes they uh, will exhibit a, a level of fear in our lives. And here's what I want to kind of lay out for you today and to kind of set the, the platform for where we're going. Today is going to be kind of like a foundation I'm going to lay that over the course of the next few uh, weeks we'll build upon that foundation. But here's the good news. In the midst of all the bad news, let me give you some good news. The good news is, is that God is sovereign. Y'all believe that today? And that he has a plan for end time events. So you and I can rest in the fact that yes, there's a lot of troubling things happening in our world. Yes, there's fear and anxiety and things that we've never quite seen before or to this level. But in the midst of it all, God has a plan. I love what the Bible says in Isaiah about God. Uh, this is what God was speaking. He said, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Notice what he says right here. Declaring the end from the beginning. Isn't that awesome? So God, I love when, when the Apostle John saw Jesus, the glorified Jesus in the book of Revelation, when he wrote the book of Revelation, I love what Jesus said. He said, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I was, I am, and I am to come. What does that mean? He is the beginning and he is the end. He's already seen the end. So he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all of my pleasure. So the good news is, is that God is sovereign. The good news is that God has a plan. The good news is God loves you and I, and we fit into his uh, purposes for right now and for the future. And so diving into that, what I thought I would do, I was thinking about all the different ways I could come at this series. And I thought, you know what I'll do? Um, I don't know about you, but I'm a very visual learner. And so I like to see things big picture. Like I love detail, but I also love to kind of zoom out, you know, that 30,000 foot view, like from being up in a plane, not just being down in the forest trying to see through the trees, but to zoom out. So don't, I'm not going to try to freak you out tonight, but I am going to try in the next five to seven minutes to give you an entire snapshot of all of God's end time plan in five minutes. Can he do it? All of you that know me are like, ain't no way, ain't no way. All right, but hang on, hang on. Go with me. I'm going to give you, and then, and then, now, let me tell you right now, it might be overwhelming for some of you to watch this, okay? But I, I promise you, by the end of this four-week series, it will make a whole lot more sense to you, okay? I'm giving you scripture references you can look up for yourself, all right? Y'all ready to go with me? Put your seatbelts on. Here we go. So where are we right now? What event are we currently in? We're in what Bible scholars call, theologians call, the church age. Um, other theologians will call us living in the dispensation of grace. Um, basically, what you'll see here is that we are living in the era where Jesus Christ has given his life, and now that incredible message and the power of the Holy Spirit has been given to God's church that you and I would tell all people. Notice, remember what Jesus predicted, that the gospel would be preached around the world in every nation. That God wants every nation God wants every people group to know him. So right now, what we're doing is we're living in the era of grace, where God has poured out his grace on the sinner, where God has proved his love by dying on the cross, and he's given that life-changing message to you and I that his church, the body of Christ, would preach that good, we call it the good news, right? That people would believe and people would be saved. And so we're living in this, this era called the church age. Now, the interesting thing is we don't know exactly when this time is going to end. We don't know when the next thing is going to happen exactly. In fact, how many of you know people have been trying to predict it for years? You know, that guy wrote that book, 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. He sold a lot of books, he made a lot of money, but he was wrong, all right? Y'all remember back, was it in 2009, that guy had billboards all over everywhere? Even in the little town of Fremont, there were billboards. Doomsday is coming on whatever day. I had so much fun with that. I got up in front of our church, I said, I guarantee you he ain't coming that day. They're like, how can you be so sure? Because the Bible said no one knows the day or the hour. So I guarantee he probably ain't going to come on a day somebody's predicting he's coming. I'm just saying. 
But anyways, that was just me being a little ornery. But anyways, so what's, what's next? We call that the rapture. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight. The rapture, this catching away of the believer. That all of a sudden, in the twinkling of an eye, God is going to, there's going to be a, a well, I'll talk more about it in a minute. But there's going to be a, a trumpet in heaven. And all of a sudden, whoosh, in the twinkling of an eye, that the believers that are alive, and boop, we're out of here. All right? It just We'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, here's the next thing that's going to happen is we are going to head into a seven-year period on the earth that is known as the tribulation, all right? The tribulation, we'll talk about that a little bit next week. The tribulation is a seven-year period that the Bible predicts will be on the earth. Uh, there'll be this man that will take over, the Antichrist. You've heard of him. We'll talk about him next week. Paul talks about him in this, uh, these books. And what will happen is, uh, it'll be after some sort of large crisis, this man will come on and bring peace. And there'll be a one world government and a gathering together. And what'll happen is the first three and a half years are going to be bad, but the last three and a half years are going to be horrible, all right? What's going to happen is God's going to roll out three waves of judgments on the earth. And the, God's plan is, is, is to help people to repent and come to him in that time. It's like God's last ditch effort to get people's attention before the end comes. Then we will have the next thing is the second coming of Christ. That is Christ's second coming. That's when he comes at the end of the book of, uh, the book of Revelation. We see um, the, the end of the tribulation period. We see this big battle that's going to happen and all these people are going to be warring against God and Jesus is going to come and we're going to come with him. And he's going to defeat all of his enemies with the sword that comes out of his mouth. So my advice is for all of us to stay in the back. Just ride in the back. All right? And there's going to be this incredible moment of God wiping out the enemies of God. And then it's going to happen is he's going to set up a thousand year millennial reign where Satan will be bound. The Bible teaches us. You can read about all this stuff in these scripture references I gave you. But what happens is Satan will be bound for a thousand years. One angel is going to come and chain him up, and he's going to be bound for a thousand years. And the saints will rule and reign with him. So can you imagine a thousand years without the devil? That would be, that's going to be great. That's all I got to say, all right? And then at the conclusion of that thousand years, um, what we're going to see is we're going to see um, that Satan is going to be loosed for a short while, and there's going to be a, a little bit of a skirmish that will happen. And um, after that skirmish, um, Satan will be thrown into the pits of hell forever. And then what will happen is we'll have this great white throne judgment. Now, that is not the judgment for believers. That's the judgment for sinners. All those that rejected Jesus Christ uh, because God is a just God, he will, they will stand before him. And because he's a just God, he'll tell them why they're not entering heaven. And that's when they will be cast into the lake of fire with the beast, false prophet, and all those things that we'll talk about. Y- y'all with me? Some of your eyeballs are really big right now. You're like, what is this? What is this? All right. Y'all with me? All right. Okay. And then, um, and then what will happen after that? is the Bible teaches us in Revelation 21 and chapters 21 and 22 that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So what's going to happen is everything that, is, that we see in this solar system is going to burn up. And God's going to renovate it by fire. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible says there's going to be a new Jerusalem. The throne of God's going to come down out of heaven. And there's going to be a new Jerusalem. It's really cool. 1,500 miles high, wide, deep. We'll talk about heaven one day. I think we'll just be able to fly around, zipper. I don't know what it's going to be like, but it's going to be awesome, all right? And there'll be no more mourning, no more crying, no more sickness, no more tears. God will reign with his people. We will live with God forevermore. How about you, but I'm looking forward to that, especially this year. Come on, Jesus. Come on back, all right? Um, But as we we look at that today, that brings us in. So y'all with me there? This will make a whole lot more sense at the end of the series, I promise you. Okay, y'all with me? Good, good. All right, so what I want to do now is is dive into this book of Thessalonians because basically what Paul did is he wrote two letters to this church uh, that that he established uh, in the city of Thessalonica, which was an ancient Greek city. You can read all about it in Acts chapter 17. But Paul planted this church, and it was made up of some Jewish people, and it was made up of a lot of, of Gentile believers, and they came to Christ, and 
There was a, a problem that happened, though, in Thessalonica as Paul began to teach that, that Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus, is the true king. It threatened the Roman Empire. It threatened, the, obviously, the, the, the leader of the Roman Empire. And because of that, the people that were believers in Thessalonica had tremendous persecution. In fact, it was so bad, uh, Paul, literally, Paul and Silas had to leave the city. It was that bad. They were going to die or they were going to leave, all right? So, so Paul had ended up having to leave. And these people suffered greatly there. Uh, they were marginalized, they were beaten, they were tortured, many of them were killed, they were marginalized, they didn't get the jobs and all the economic things that other people got in that city because they were believers, their families turned on them. I mean, I want to tell you what, if you were a believer and you were a longtime believer in Thessalonica, you were the real deal, all right? So Paul, he writes two letters to these, <clears throat> these precious people. And basically the first three chapters of the book of 1 Thessalonians, his first letter, he is just encouraging them and he is commending them because they're doing such a, a great job. Now I want to tell you though, one of the reasons why he wrote this letter though is that the, the struggle that they were having is they were all believing that Jesus was going to come back. Paul told them, Jesus is coming back. Well, they thought he was coming back very soon and their loved ones were dying. And they were kind of confused and because my loved ones are dying. What happens when Jesus comes back? Do they miss out? And so he wrote this book to teach them about life after death. How I many you know heaven? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So the moment you breathe your last breath on this earth, you know where you breathe the next one? In the very presence of God, right? But he wanted to tell them that, oh, no, no, no. When, when, when Jesus comes back, Something to get his bride, something real special is going to happen. Your loved ones are going to go first. We'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. I'll try to make it plain for you. So here's what Paul did. He, he wrote these letters to comfort and encourage the people by revealing God's future plans. In fact, look what he says in verse 13. He says, But I do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He said, Listen, we grieve when we lose a loved one. You know, how many of you know, if you lose a loved one, it's, it's tough times. And, um, you know, it's, it's tough when, when that happens and you feel the loss. But as believers, we don't grieve without hope because we have hope, right? We're people of hope. We know that our, our believing loved ones, they, they went into the presence of God. We shouldn't feel sorry for them. Truth be told, they feel sorry for us, right? Because they're in the very presence of God. And so he's trying to encourage them, and he's trying to give them, oh, listen, there's, there's beautiful life after death. He wanted to comfort them. He gets the first three chapters, and he's just commending them. He's like, man, you guys are awesome. You're facing all this, this persecution and all the struggles that you're going through, and yet you're standing for Christ. And so he encourages them, be holy, live for God, let your love one for another grow. And he's encouraging him, and then he lays out God's plan, all right? And here's the first thing that you will see. The first end time revelation that Paul gives is called what we call the rapture, all right? And here's what we see in these verses that we looked at uh, today in, in verses 16 and 17. It says, so at this moment, this appointed time, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, look at this, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the word rapture is not in the Bible, just in case you're wondering. The, that word rapture is not a, that's a, that's a word that Bible scholars, theologians, Bible translators came up with. What they're referring to is this, this section right here, this, where it says caught up. Literally what that means in the original language, it means to seize by force. It's like to snatch. Like, this is a bad illustration, but like a robber would snatch something, you know? It's, it's like a, it's a quick, it's a snatch, it's a, it's a pulling out. And so, Paul goes on to say, this is what's going to happen, um, that when, whenever God as the Father is ready, there's going to be a shout, there's going to be a trumpet in heaven, and Jesus is going to come, and he is going to get his people. Now notice this. It says, and the dead in Christ, what's happening? They were worried about their loved ones that died, right? He said, the dead in Christ will rise first. Well, what does that mean? He's talking about the physical body. How many of you know, when your physical body dies, you go into a grave? 
Where does the real you go? Your soul, your spirit, right into the presence of God, right? But the Bible predicts that there's going to come a time when you will get this new, improved you. All right? We call it a glorified body. All right? So what does that mean? It means you have hair. Thank you, Jesus. If you lost your six-pack, I lost mine a long time ago. It might come back, right? I'm just saying. I don't know. I'm, just, I'm putting in my order for what I'm hoping for someday. But <clears throat> So the Bible says what will happen is the dead in Christ will rise. So all of a sudden, that physical body, wherever it is, people say, if I got cremated, is that okay? Yeah, God made you from the dust. It doesn't matter. He'll find you. And all of a sudden, boom, you are, you're, the dead in Christ are going to come up, that, and something's going to happen. I don't, we don't know exactly how it all plays out. I don't want to just speculate, but somehow your soul and that body is going to get all new, and it's going to be awesome. You're going to be like, whoa, look at this. And it's going to be a body that lives forever. And then what happens, it says, those that remain. So it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall ever be we ever with the Lord. So in that moment, thus those of us that are alive, I don't know about you, but I think it would be pretty cool to be alive for the rapture. I do. I, I'm a little, little nervous about it, but I mean, it would be kind of cool, right? I mean, what's that going to be like? Is it going to be like... Star Wars or Star Trek, you know, beam me up, Scotty, doom. You know, remember where they would go in that thing and then they would tran- teleport, transport, whatever they did. I don't know what it's going to be like, but in that moment, and it's not going to be this long, it's going to be like in a, in a twinkling of an eye, like bam, just like that. You and I are going to, if we're alive at that moment, we are not going to face death. We're going to go. I mean, what's the world going to be like in that moment? Can you imagine? All of a sudden, these Christians are gone. I mean, if you've ever watched any of the Left Behind movies or the books, Tim LaHaye did a marvelous job with those. And I want to tell you what I've studied. He, he wrote a book on the book of Revelation that I've just, over the years, devoured. Um, just love his. Um, but, I mean, those movies, they, they tell you, you know, cars crashing and things. I mean, just who knows? We don't really know what it's going to be like. But imagine what that will be like in, in that moment. In fact, Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians, we read this a lot as a pastor when we're doing the committal service at a funeral. A lot of times when we're, we're laying that body to rest, we'll read this. This is what he's talking about. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Look at this. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will raise what? Incorruptible. This body won't die anymore. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Isn't that good news? So just like that, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise. Those that are alive will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling, and we will go to meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever, in that moment, be with the Lord. Now, what I didn't tell you is when that happens, what I believe, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, that will begin to initiate the tribulation. But what's cool is, I'm going to do a week on heaven because I didn't put it in the timeline, but while the tribulation's going on down here, we're going to be experiencing some really awesome stuff in heaven at that time. We'll talk about that at another time. All right? But here's what, time-wise, this is what we believe. This is what I believe. That in a pre-tribulation rapture, people have different thoughts on this. This is not an essential. People can have their own ideas about this. But this is what we believe as a church. This is what I personally believe. Um, 1 Thessalonians, in the same book, when he opened it up, look what he said. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living God, he's bragging on them, and to wait for the Son from heaven, look at this, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from what? The wrath to come. God's wrath and the tribulation that gets poured out, God's going to spare us from that. In fact, it's what's cool is, if I had a little more time, I'd go a little bit more in detail with you, but as you read the book of Revelation, the first three chapters are all about the, the, the visible church at that moment. But you, as you begin to see chapter 4, there's 18 references to the church in those first three chapters. And then when chapter 4 begins, uh, God tells um, John, come up here. And he begins to look from a different view. And that's a lot of Bible scholars believe that symbolizes the rapture. Because after that, throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, the church is not mentioned anymore. So I, I believe, and I believe that, that, yes. In fact, he even said to the church, I think it was the church at Philadelphia in Revelation 3.10, he says, I will keep you from this hour of trial. Now, there are other people that believe, and good Christians that believe that, that the rapture will happen maybe midpoint because the, the tribulation period is broken into two, three and a half 
year sections, and the second half's really bad, and they believe that right in the middle there will be zapped out of here. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to debate that with you, but I have strong belief that it'll happen before, and I'm believing it will happen before, because I don't even want to be in the first half. I'm, I want to be out of here, right? So here's what you and I can learn today. Um, let me kind of break it down, because some people are confused about the coming of Christ. Let me say it like this, real plain. Jesus will be coming back two times. Once to get his bride, that's the church, that's the rapture, and then he will come back once with his bride, that's the second coming, all right? So that's what, because a lot of times people get confused. So the rapture is this, boop, we're out of here, he comes and gets us, and then what we see at the end of the book of, uh, or at the end of the tribulation, we come back with him, and we are the bride of Jesus Christ. So, so I gave you a lot of stuff today in this little bit of time that we've had. But like I said a moment ago, what should this do for you and I? This should give you and I comfort. This should give you and I faith. That even though the world is crazy, even though things are are, are painful and difficult, even though things happen in our world that we don't like, here's what I want you to know. God loves us, and God has a plan. And in the end, God wins, and so do we. And we can take hope in that. And that's what he was telling. He was telling this, this poor church at Thessalonica. They're, I mean, they're beat up for the faith. They're barely hanging on. And he said, someday it's going to be worth it all. Hang in there. Don't give up. What did Jesus say? He who endures to the end shall be saved. So what does that mean practically for you and I today? What, what, can, we, what, what can we take from this? Because, again, I don't want to fill your head with knowledge. I want to fill your life with purpose. So here's, here's the first thing you and I can take home today. And that is we have to be ready. Look what he went on to say in this book in chapter 5. He said, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. You see, we don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back. We don't know when that rapture is going to take place. So we have to be ready. The Bible teaches us at every moment. I think as we look around the world and we see the signs of the times, that doesn't mean he's coming back tomorrow or 10 years from now. We don't know exactly when. But what do the signs do? When you see the signs, when you see pestilence like COVID-19, do you know what it is for me? I don't know if it means Jesus is coming back now or 100 years from now, two thousand, a year, thousand. I don't know. But what I do know is he's getting closer. And what I do know is It's time to get really serious in our walk with God. It's not time to play games. It's not, that's why he said, he talked about don't sleep. He talks about your people of the day, live in the day, people of the light, people of righteousness. This is not time to have one foot in God and one foot in the world. It's not time to be playing around with sin and kind of half-hearted in and out. This is time to be like all in with Jesus because you never know when he's coming back. Remember, like the analogy of the, you know, the, 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 the women with the, the oil and the lanterns and the virgins with the lanterns. And when the bridegroom comes, some of them were ready, some of them were not. That's all illustrations of, of the fact that he's going to come when we're not ready. And we need to be ready. We need to be all in. In fact, it's kind of cool when you look at this. I, I don't have a lot of time to elaborate on this. But remember what Jesus said? He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, it has many rooms. If that were not so, I w- would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know what's really neat about this? There's analogies that this is very much like a, like a Jewish wedding. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you guys all know, but Brittany Casto is getting married. Tomorrow, her fam- some of her family's here. We're so happy for Brittany and Brian. I get a chance to do their wedding tomorrow. I'm all excited. I'm not trying, trying to embarrass her too bad. Have a little fun, maybe. But no, <clears throat> it's going to be a wonderful time. But two wonderful, wonderful young folks getting married. And, you know, but it's, it's interesting. The Jewish weddings were really interesting. Jewish weddings were, were arranged. How many of y'all parents wish you could do that? I'm thinking I might want to try to arrange something for my kids. I'm just trying to think. <laughs> uh, the grace of God kept me waiting for the right one. I'm so glad for that because I almost blundered it, blew it bad. But they arranged marriages back in those days, and they had a betrothal process. And, like, the families would go into contract, like, yeah, my daughter's going to marry your son. And, they, and literally at that moment, the son, in this betrothal process, the son or the future husband would go, and he would prepare a home. He would go prepare a home, and his father would oversee its construction. 
And the father, his father, would determine when the, we- when the wedding actually happens. And so the bride, she, would, she had an idea, but she didn't know exactly when it was going to happen. So she would have to get herself all ready, and she would have to be ready. And whenever the father says, okay, this meets my standards, you go get your little lady, and you go, let's go have a wedding ceremony. In that moment, then, then literally he would go, and if she was ready, she didn't want to be caught with curlers in her hair. You know, didn't want to have the pajamas on at that moment. When he came, she wanted to be looking fine and ready to go. And then that's what happened. So she didn't know when, so she had to have this constant readiness. And that's what God says for you and I. Like, he's going to come back. Thank you. He's going he's gonna to come back, and, and we've got to be ready because I don't know. Because the Father, you know, the Bible says no one knows the day or the hour. Only the Father. You know, Jesus doesn't even know. The, only the Father, the Bible says, knows. And whenever he feels like, Jesus, you've done a good job up here, go get him. That's going to be you and I. And we need to be, in that moment, you need to be ready when he comes. It's funny, I, I read a story about an Italian gardener. Him and his, he and his wife's job was to take care of this, this beautiful castle on these grounds in northern Italy. And I was reading that one day he had some guests that were coming and he was giving them a tour. And he took them through the castle and he took them out onto the grounds. The grounds were gorgeous. Green, you know, golf course, course glass, the, the grass, the flowers, and the hedges were perfect. And the person that he was getting the tour said, hey, um, this is beautiful. It's amazing. You keep all this so beautiful. When's the last time the owner's been here? He said, oh, about 10 years ago he stopped in. And they said, and you keep, it's been 10 years since he's been here, and you, you keep this so pristine? Is he supposed to come back next week? He's like, well, I, I don't really know. I just, I just live every day, and I take care of this place like he's coming back today. And, you know, that's the way you and I should be living our Christian life. Like, he could come back today. I want to be about his business. I want to be living it and loving and, and doing what he's called me to do. Here's the second thing, is that if we believe this, we should reach those who don't know Christ. You know, when, when people talk about his coming, in fact, look what Peter said. He said that there's going to come in the last days, people are going to scoff. Oh, where is this Jesus promising to come back? Look what he says. Knowing first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? The Lord, and look what he goes on to say in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us. Look, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Repentance. Why is God holding off? Because he wants as many people in heaven as possible. You see, God made hell for the devil. He didn't make hell for man. God sent his own son to get as many people into heaven as possible. That's why we're in the dispensation of grace. That's why we're in the church age. God wants the gospel to be preached to every area of the world. And then the end will come. Why? Because God wants every single, even the tribulation, we'll talk about that. It's not just God's wrath. It's his way of getting people's attention and a final plea to come to him. That's why at that great white throne judgment, it's not God being mean. It's like, I gave you every chance in the world, and you rejected me. And so we got to view God. And that's our job. Like, my job and your job is to tell people, your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers, your friends. Can I ask you a question? When's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When's the last time that you took somebody out for coffee and just talked about God? When's the last time you prayed with somebody outside of the church? When's the last time you invited somebody to come to church with you? Um, These are great opportunities for us in these days, in these hours. People are hungry. People are searching. And we have the answer for them. All right, and then here's the last thing is increase your love walk. Look what he was encouraging them when he was talking to them. He said this. He said, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. But we urge you, brethren, that you should increase more and more. You know, last week I began talking with you about our unity and the love that we share. That as a church, we are a a diverse family of all different backgrounds, ages, socioeconomic backgrounds, ethnicities, life experiences. And the beauty of the church, what we find in the book of Revelation, is we are all standing before the throne of God. 
every nation, every tribe, every tongue. God wants us to love. As a matter of fact, what did Jesus say in John 13, 35? He said, it's your love. He goes, this new commandment I give you to love one another is I have loved you. And by this will the world know you're my disciples. Now more than ever, you and I have an opportunity to love one another, to go out of our way to build relationships, to show love with people in our church and believers outside of our church. I was going to share as I close out my sermon tonight, I wanted to share with you something really important. You know, we have a family all the way around the world. Did you know that? People for Care and Learning, PCL. We have a, we have, we're a family with these precious believers in Cambodia. We got to partner with them a few years ago. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ken and Susan Ferguson, who are running our missions um, department, um, they shared with us a need about what's happening in Cambodia. You know, these people, <clears throat> they were war-torn by hatred and bigotry. You might remember back in the 70s when that communist regime came in and they had a genocide. Somehow feeling like one group was better than the other. That's pure from the pits of hell. And these, um, over a million people were killed. I mean, it was horrific. In fact, we went to Cambodia, and the second group we went, that we took, uh, Ryan and I went the first time, but the second group got to see the museum. And it's a museum that, that remembers what those people went through. It's horrific. And they've been coming back ever since. Well, PCL is doing an incredible job reaching people for Christ. It's one of the least known areas for Christ, reached areas for Christ in the world. It's in the 1040 window. A few weeks ago, they got, this is their rainy season, they got torrential rains and it washed out all of their, all of their fields, their, their rice fields, and, and these people are struggling like never before. And we're getting ready to do Buy a Tree, Change a Life, and I got to say, um, I want to thank all of our business owners and people that have already given to that. At this point, we pretty much have all of the expenses taken care of. We're excited about that. If you are a business and you want to give towards it still, we have some, some things that you could help with. Um, but then we also said that we wanted to get, because that money's going to get to them later on, like probably January, February, they'll get that money. But we wanted to take up an immediate offering. And um, at this point in time, just in that week or so of just sharing with you, we've had, already had $3,600 come in that we've been able to send directly to them. And I'm so blessed by that. Not to mention all of the needs for Buy a Tree have already been taken care of. It's incredible to see your love, because what does love do? It gives, right? God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave. So you, have an, you and I have an opportunity right now to love, to love one another, to come together and to care for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have an opportunity to share the faith of Jesus Christ and make sure whatever you do in this season that you're all in with Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. <clears throat> Bow your heads and close your eyes. Let me, let me ask you a question today as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, even those of you who are home today. Let me ask you a question. Where are you with Jesus today? You know, the greatest question that we ever have to answer in life is, did I know Jesus Christ? Did I put my faith in him? That God loved us so much that he's even willing to upset the apple cart to get our attention. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life today? If you've not, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment to put your faith in Christ. Maybe you did this as a child, but you drifted away. And uh, maybe you feel like the Lord's tugging on your heart tonight. Let me ask another question. Maybe you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, but let me ask you this. Are you all in? Are you giving everything you have for Jesus Christ? Are you all in in that relationship today? If you're not, I want to encourage you today to recommit, rededicate your life. To say, you know what, in this hour, I'm, I'm not going to play games with God. I'm going to be all in. I hope that you'll do that. And then secondly, is there somebody in your life that needs to hear about Christ that maybe God could use you to reach out to? I want to encourage you with that today. Let's make sure that our lot in this life is a life of love, that we're loving our neighbor and loving those that are near and dear to us. Can we all pray together today? I'm, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot or embarrass anybody. But if you need to put your faith in Christ today, whether you're here, whether you're at home, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Can we all pray it together? Just say this with me. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. And I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I put my faith in you today. 
as my personal Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins and help me to live for you. In Jesus' name. And amen. Well, I want to thank you again for being with us tonight. You're not going to want to miss the next three weeks of this series. Uh, this is all going to kind of come together and make more sense for you. It's going to be inspiring, relevant, practical. So we hope we'll see you back next week. Here comes Andrew. Give it up for Andrew. He awesome. Well, we want to thank you for being here today. All, all I can say is that Michigan loses this weekend and the pastor is talking about the end of the world. So... It's been a joy being your youth pastor. Uh, <laughs> no, that was that was great. Um, but <laughs> I had the text ready to the staff like as soon as the clock hit zero today when uh, when the when when the Wolverines lost. But anyway. Um, I'll stop now. Um, hey, I want to remind you, Growth Track is starting next week. Uh, you can sign up online. There's a card in the bulletin also that you can use to sign up. What a great time Growth Track is. It's so informative about what our church believes. And um, also just you learn a lot about yourself. Can't encourage you enough to, to um, sign up for Growth Track if you've never had the opportunity to do that. Please please sign up for that. And also, you know, Pastor was talking about Buy a Tree, Change a Life, and, and we have been so blessed by your generosity. And I want to remind you that you can still sign up to work a shift at our Christmas tree lot. Um, the iPad is in the back. I'll be back there immediately after the service tonight to help you sign up. So if you haven't had an opportunity yet, don't miss out on that opportunity to, to serve and to work that, that Christmas tree lot. It's a great time. You get to meet people. Um, if you're new, I know my wife and I, we did it our first year, and uh, we uh, we got to meet some really cool people while doing it. So uh, make sure you, you take that opportunity to sign up. And then uh, we're going to move into our time of tithes and offerings. And just want to remind you, there are three ways that you can give. You can give online, you can give through our mobile app, and you can give in person uh, at the boxes at the back. So please feel no pressure to give if this is your first time here. Uh, but, you know, if you are a faithful member of Woodlawn Church, Thank you so much for your generosity uh, to help us do the things that we do here. So let's pray and you'll be dismissed today. Lord, we just thank you for another opp opportunity to be in your house and to worship you, to be fed, Lord. I just pray that as we go through this week, Lord, that we would live ready for you and live as if you're coming at any minute, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray that you would bless us now. Bless the gifts that are given. Help us to use those for your kingdom and for your glory. Be with us. Keep us safe. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You if you're a regular attendee of Woodlawn and would like to give today, you can do so by clicking the giving tab on our website. Giving online is safe, secure, and easy to do. But if you would like, you're more than welcome to send your tithes and offerings in the mail or drop them off at the church office. Thank you all so much for your continuous prayers and support. Thanks again for joining us today. We would love to have you visit one of our three weekend services, Saturdays at 6 p.m. and Sundays at 9 a.m. and 1045. We appreciate your patience and understanding during this time and look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless and we'll see you then.